I believe what we're gonna talk about this morning is very important. We're, this is the second part of a series, Hostile or Christ? Strange topic, I know, Hostile or Christ? And this morning's subtopic is Sabbath or self? Sabbath or self? We're gonna dive right in. Hebrews 4, who knows what Hebrews 4 is about? Just gave you a big hint, Robin. Entering into the rest of God. Oh, that's a good double entendre. The rest and the rest of God. There, Hebrews chapter four and verse one. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, that means this morning there's a promise of entering into his rest. It's still standing. Let us fear, that's a strong word. Lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it, to fall short, just like it says, all have sinned and come short of the actual glory of God. He says, I actually want you to carry a rightful fear of failing to enter into my rest that I have for you. It is not automatic, even though it's a promise. It's a promise. If you want it, you can enter into my rest, but it's not automatic. Verse two, both those in the old covenant in Israel and us in the New Testament. For good news came to us just like to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. God came and told them, I'm going to bring you into a promised land. I'm going to give you this incredibly wealthy land. And they said, no. And we're going to see this in a minute. Not just, we don't believe you. We refuse to believe you. We refuse to believe that you are great enough to bring us into our promised land. It says the message came, and what it literally means is they did not mix it with faith. And so the promise died, they lost it. And the really sad part is Caleb and Joshua had to spend 40 years walking with dead people who were simply grinding out 40 years until their children were old enough to go in and receive what they refused. That is horrendous. Verses three through five, here's what he's saying. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, I actually swore, not bad words, he made an irrevocable swearing because as God, he actually says, I was angry with them. Here I am able to speak out billions of planets and stars and everything working in the universe. And you're telling me that I am so weak, I cannot help you defeat Lilliputians, I'm angry at you. I'm not neutral, I'm mad. Now, a lot of people go, oh no, God, oh no, God gets angry. Do you know what he doesn't get angry about? Weakness. He gets angry at refusing to be persuaded. That's what made him angry. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Do you know everything in the plan of God that's happened so far and will was finished in the mind of God? And I'll just tell you, there's a great secret about this that relates to certain other things. And that's what the Hebrew mindset understood. In God's mind, if he has purposed it, 
it's as real as it's already happened. That's why Romans says he speaks of those things that are not as if they already were. In his mind, outside of time, knowing there's nothing that can stop my purposes, it's already done. They already were in the promised land in God's mind, but they stopped what he had purposed for them. Next. Oh, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Now, this is an amazing thing. God was not sweating in the late afternoon on the sixth day from all of his work. He's never broken a sweat. Here's what he's saying. I gave you this profound picture that after I did all of my work, I stopped and I ceased and I rested from doing any more of my works. And he's taking that profound, powerful picture of God stopping working. And then he transitions and says, and again, well, can you go back to verse four? For he spoke about it. He stopped working, rested. Okay, now we go to verse five. And again, in this passage, he said, it's as if God is saying, this really troubles me. You are not going to enter into my rest that I had for you in this new land. I'm upset. Next. Since therefore it remains for some to enter in. This is incredibly good news. But some formerly received the good news and they failed to enter in because of disobedience. And that word again means refusing. It's not that I'm ignorant. God is not upset at ignorance. He is highly upset at a refusal to believe him. I know I'm making this a big point and there's a reason. Again, he appoints a certain day. This just rose up like a fountain in me. Even this morning, again, as I was looking at it, again, he appointed a certain day. Today, saying through David, David was hundreds of years after they tried to enter the promised land. And God was saying, I anointed David to write about another day. And David wrote it in Psalm, I believe it's 95. Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't harden your hearts. Oh, we're, we're way past where, okay. So here's the point that we saw. Rest, what he's talking about, what God's saying, is a state where we are no longer in conflict with God. The battle between fallen nature and the purposes and plans of God for your life have ceased. You're now at rest because you are only cooperating with God. The, the battles are stopping in your mind. You're not using all this energy to mine yours, mine yours, my way, your way. So what's the whole point? God makes this magnificent, strange analogy saying, as much as I stopped creating planets, oceans, plants, trees, and my greatest creation, man, I stopped. I am ordering you, commanding you, requiring you, you stop your own works and instead 
enter into my rest. Remember the song I did it my way? That was not a song that came out of heaven. And he's so adamant about this, when that people refused to enter, he says, my wrath actually came up to the point where I said, irrevocably, you will not enter this land. I have had it to hear. Verses 6 through 9 Uh, Let's just read verse eight and nine. Because if Joshua had given them rest, this is really quite profound, then God would not have spoken of another day later on. If they'd already entered into the rest, he wouldn't have said, well, there's still rest up ahead that's available. Next verse. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. This is really beautiful. I'm not saying you're all necessarily where I've been. I, I spent a lot more time, it may not seem like it, studying this, and it has so filled me inside. Uh, but I think you'll really get it as we keep going. So here's what he's saying. That nation, the first Israel physical, forfeited their promised land. And it was only one reason. They refused to believe me. This word unbelief or disobedience is a pythia, and it means a willful refusal to believe. You know what it means? A mind that is hostile to God. Remember last week we talked about the natural mind is not neutral. The mind that has not been attached to a spirit that's had new birth from heaven is hostile to God. And every spirit-filled believer who for four minutes on Tuesday or a whole hour on Sunday morning that insists on looking at everything through their natural mind becomes instantly hostile to God and they don't even know it. That's why this is so serious. That's why the title, hostile or Christ. God is really trying to move his church right now over into the mind of Christ so that they function and think and relate and act out of the mind of Christ because Christ was the exact representation of God. That's what Colossians says. Like an actual imprint oh, I see God in Jesus Christ. So he's saying, if I'm willing to make the mind of Jesus Christ available to you, don't refuse it. Don't refuse it. And I'll tell you how scary it is. On Mount Sinai, when God actually came down and the mountain was smoking with black smoke, it says like a furnace because God actually was touching the mountain with his baby finger, and it just was smoking and roaring like a furnace. And he had them play the trumpet, and the blasts of the trumpet were, bah! saying, attention, I'm going to talk to you, God, I'm coming down to talk to you. This is really frightening to me. It says literally in the Greek language that the people of Israel begged and asked themselves to be excused. They did not want to hear the words that God wanted to speak to them. They said, this is too much. We would like to be excused from this class. That's what it literally means. And then he says this, don't you dare today ask to be excused when I'm not speaking on earth from a mountain out of smoke, I'm now speaking to you directly out of heaven. Do not ask to be excused from what I want to tell you. And here's what's sobering to me more and more lately. We had a pretty long discussion with a few people a few weeks ago about this. 
most of the church, believers, spirit-filled, refuse to follow the four gospels. Forgive your enemies. No. Walk in humility. No, I'm afraid to do that. I'm afraid they'll take advantage of me if I humble myself. Give, and it'll be given back to you. No, I can't trust you, God. <laughs> Kidding me? I can't afford to give anything out of my money. You are not trustworthy. You will let me starve. I will not be able to pay rent. Now, we don't see it that way. We see it as, this is wisdom. This is walking in balance. This is just being not, not being stupid. Verse 12, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Here's what he says. Take heed, brothers, lest ever there might be in you an evil, not neutral, an evil heart of unpersuadableness. Same word. I want to unify my church. There's no way. That's not happening. You couldn't do that, God. You shall receive power from on high when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Not me. It doesn't work. It's impossible. I'll tell you, God spoke to me over there when we were praying before service. I mean, he was making, I tried to pray out a little bit of it. I am perfect. I have given you every promise. I never break a promise. Nobody's ever counseled me. I am perfect. And I felt like his voice was a little serious in my spirit this morning. Essentially, I didn't say this, but here's what he was saying. You stop dialoguing with each other about why my promises don't work. You quit excusing yourselves for why we're not having revival. You go back to the drawing board and believe my word and take it seriously. Pray always. Give no place to the devil. That means no topography. The word is topos. Don't give any ground to the enemy. And here's what I, I mean, it was confronting I felt like he was saying, how dare you even imply that there's something wrong with me or my promises. Get this straight. You get that straight. There is nothing wrong with me, my promises, my ability. So every lack that we have is, needs more prayer, more forgiveness, more humility, more brokenness, more purity, more faith, more belief, more trust, less self, less gossip, less spreading subtly unbelief to others. When they came and God said, you're going into the land, and the 10 spies said, oh, no, we're not. There's an amazing verse. It says, that night, all of Israel went back to their tents, and they mumbled. They murmured is what the word means. They murmured. Nancy and I went back to our tent and said, I don't see how in the world God's going to move at the well. There's no way he can really do what he said. And we're building this building and we're going to end up a spectacle of futility and shame. I mean, I just, you know, blah, 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 you know. they murmured. They said, we are grasshoppers. Those are giants. I mean, this is actually, this made God angry. I'm not, I am not trying to be a bully this morning. Verse 12, 
I'll keep reading it. Take heed, wake up, shake sleep, lest any of you start entertaining an evil heart of unbelief into falling away from the living God. But instead, verse 13, encourage one another every day while it's called today. He spoke of another day. You know what the other day is? Today. That's the day because it's always the day. This is what the Lord spoke to me this morning. It's always the day, this new day of entering into his rest. While it's still called today so that not one of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness, the trickery of sin. For we have become partners with Christ. That's what the word means, partners. Same word that when the disciples caught so many fish, they couldn't get them in the boat, they called to their partners. We have been called as partners with Jesus Christ. If indeed we should hold firm unto the end, the assurance that we got at the beginning. Remember when you got saved and you went, wow, I'm saved. I got eternal life. He's saying, you've got to hold on to that assurance. Walk out your salvation. Don't let an evil heart start to say, I am a victim. I'm a Pentecostal victim of my longings. I want so much, but I'm a victim because God can't do it. So why don't I give up, come back down to earth and go, let's call it good. Do you know this morning, so beautiful during the worship. Did any of you get some really pertinent presence and download this morning? I was being downloaded, not just feeling his presence. I was being downloaded during that time. Chapter 3, 7 through 19, verse 15. As it is said today, if you should hear his voice, don't harden your heart as in the rebellion. Here's what I want to point something out because chapter 4, I'm sorry, I put it in here because chapter 4 will not make sense. Why was God so uptight? swearing in his anger. You're not going, why? Let me, let, let me just read you. Here's the phrases in chapter three that come before chapter four. Harden their hearts. Rebellion in the day of testing. 40 years, they tested me. They saw my works. I was angry with that generation because they constantly go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I told them, you're not going to enter into my rest. Then he says, take heed brothers, lest in any of you, because this is what was in them, an evil heart of unpersuadableness. They were unpersuadable, falling away from a living God. They were hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. He's saying, today, I want you to hear his voice and don't you harden your hearts like they did in the ignorance? No, the rebellion. That's how God looked at that. For those who heard, rebelled. Does there seem to be a theme here? With whom was I indignant for 40 years, if not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell, their carcasses fell in the wilderness. And I swore you are not going to enter my rest. Who did I say that to? Those who refused to believe that I could do it and bring them into a promised land. And so we see they were not able to enter because of being un persuadable. 